Hello, everyone. So, um, yeah, as Bertrand was saying, uh, I work for the New York Times. Uh, I'm a search engineer, and I've been there for about three years now. Uh, and today, I want to talk to you about how we're doing search now. So the goal of search is obviously to be able to surface any piece of content. Uh, and this is actually a really hard problem, especially in the news domain, uh, where the meaning of a keyword can dramatically change from one day to the next. For example, today, if someone were searching for Sri Lanka, what the intent behind that query would be would be dramatically different from a couple weeks ago. Um, in the past year, we've radically changed how we approach this problem. And so today, I want to talk to you about what we were doing before and why it wasn't sustainable for us, and then sort of the techniques we've adopted since then um, in order to start tackling this problem in a more systematic way. Uh, so for a bit of background about how search works at the New York Times, um, up to uh, 2018, uh, it had worked more or less unchanged for a number of years. Um, it powers site search. It also powers a number of other services. There are a lot of internal and external consumers of search. Uh, one I like in particular is Times Machine, which is a web-based microfiche reader. So it's a great way to go read all this really old archive content that New York Times has put out. So you can go see um, the front page you know, of FDR's election day, um, which is, all, is really cool stuff to see. Uh, we use Elasticsearch as our search framework, and there's about 18 million articles that have been published since 1851. Uh, so it's not a lot of content, but it's still tricky enough uh, that it's hard to find the right piece of content to surface. <coughs> so here's our super detailed architecture. Um, there's two main bits that we write. So we, we work around Elasticsearch. We have uh, an ingest component uh, where we take content from Scoop, which is the internal CMS system we use at the New York Times. Um, and we also have an API component where we take uh, user queries and we translate that into an Elasticsearch query. So pretty standard setup. So uh, I'm going to go in a bit uh, uh, how our query worked before. Uh, it was this pretty simple query here, uh, right here. So we had this query string query uh, with a Gaussian decay. Um, the way the query string query worked is essentially uh, we would be translating this query for like French toast. Uh, we'd be looking in a few different fields. Um, we would want all the fields to match, except we would relax that requirement a little bit. And this would be to handle things like spelling uh, or over-specified searches. This next bit was the Gaussian decay. So we're news search. People generally want the newest content. Um, so we had a pretty strong Gaussian over, uh, over the, uh, the publication date. So altogether, um, we get this sort of query right here. Um, when someone searches Fren French toast, what we were asking Elasticsearch was, uh, find me fr uh, all the content where French toast appears in the headline, the body, the byline, uh, where it mostly matches, uh, and give me the most recent content possible. So this worked OK for immediately recent content that had keyword matches. Uh, beyond that, it fell apart pretty quickly. And so we actually had to give our internal users, we often had to write custom queries for them to be able to surface the content they needed. And this isn't something that was super scalable. And it's not something that external users could obviously benefit from. So a whole class of users just couldn't really use search super well. The thing is, we had a really hard time improving on this query. And so mostly we didn't. Um, query changes were pretty much only prompted by an immediate need. So we would have a ticket, and we would try and do the minimum work possible to make that little query or that small use case work. 
Um, because most of the time when we made changes, we had unintended side effects. Uh, and this would often break search for other use cases. Um, the big reason for this was because while we were the search team, it wasn't our main mission. Relevance wasn't something we primarily did. And we didn't have a very deep understanding of search. And this was the status quo for the search team for a very long time. But this approach wasn't sustainable for us. And so the final straw, uh, one day we had an exasperated user. Uh, they had this query, Bruce Lambert hot dogs. And they were very frustrated. They couldn't find any relevant results. So they were looking for this article here. And so you can see this is a, this seems it's like a sensible match. It has hot dogs in the headline. Bruce Lambert is the author. This is clearly the piece. This is what they wanted. Um, this is what they were getting instead. And so this is kind of an insane response. If you saw this as the top result from a search system, it wouldn't inspire a lot of confidence. You wouldn't trust anything that came after this or any other queries you were doing. Um, so I realized if I were going to try to actually start fixing this stuff, I had to learn about search. So let's go look at that query string query for Bruce Lambert hot dogs. So you can see in this query, uh, we're looking for Bruce in the headline, the body, or the byline. And then Lambert in the headline, the body, or the byline, et cetera. So this isn't exactly intuitive if you're, if you're not familiar with how this query works. And so if we go back to that result that we were looking at, uh, we can see that Bruce matches, Lambert matches, hot matches, and dogs match. So we have a 100% keyword match as we've constructed this query. The way we've, we've said this, this is a perfect match. And it's even a more recent piece of content than the one uh, that we were looking for. <clears throat> so really, we had a search system, but to be honest, when it worked, it was more of a fluke than anything. It was really just because people often search for news content, and we strongly bias towards n new content. So I thought, let me approach this again, and let me write a new query. So I read through the docs. Uh, I felt newly confident that I understood how search worked. And I wrote a new query from scratch. I spot checked it on Bruce Lambert hot dogs. I spot checked it on other queries that we had had complaints about and a few others. It looked really good. So I was pretty excited that this was going to work well. Um, and we deployed it. <clears throat> Except it did not work well. So I was hoping people would start complimenting, saying like, wow, search works really well now. Uh, except literally the opposite happened. We started having a lot of complaints immediately. Uh, and it turns out we had broken some things uh, and some features we didn't even know we had uh, as a result of the query string query. Uh, so we broke phrase queries. Those just didn't work anymore. Uh, and we'd also really damaged the surfacing of recent political content. Uh, so those results were a lot more mixed up now. Uh, and a lot of people didn't like this, so we just had to roll back. And this was really frustrating for us. So. We needed to go deeper. It was time to understand document scores. So for this query, US economy, you can see we have these three articles, and they have scores. That's helpful, but it's not that helpful, because I don't know why they had scores, uh, had these particular scores. So fortunately, Elasticsearch lets you go deeper, and you can begin to see which impact, or the impact of a particular field uh, for a query, as well as sort of the impact of that Gaussian decay. And this, and this uh, gave us the ability to start looking at what was actually happening in our search system and understand what our queries meant. Um, 
<clears throat> so looking at Bruce Lambert hot dogs and some of the other queries, uh, I realized that a lot of our issues could be fixed uh, if we just reinterpreted the data. Uh, so we needed to reanalyze the data. Uh, and this is pretty easy, right? We just now need to make a new index with some new mappings to change how we're going to do it and then re-ingest all the content. Uh, there was just like a slight problem with this. It was impossible. We could not actually re-ingest data. So if I showed you, or if you remember before, our architecture here, it ingests content from Scoop, which is the CMS, except Scoop doesn't have all the data. So if you look at the corpora for search, uh, Scoop is this final slice on the end, CMS JSON. This is the modern era. This is the web scale. You know, this is digital native. The rest is not. So we have content going back to 1851. A lot of this content has been transcribed uh, or OCR'd by different vendors over the years. They've done various segments. Uh, they overlap. The main problem for us, though, is we didn't know where this data lived. We had had an a version of this data at one point that existed in the index, uh, but we didn't have the raw data anymore. So it wasn't, it wasn't stored with source, if you know that bit in the Elasticsearch. Um, and that was a big problem for us. Uh, this lived in many places. Uh, a lot of it lived on hard drives that some people just had. So didn't know where to get this, didn't know the authoritative source for it, didn't know which format it was in at the start. So. There was a massive project, uh, and I can't overstate how massive this project was, to put all of this content into a single format in a single place. So now all of this lives uh, in a Kafka uh, that we can just consume from. Uh, and we took our time from infinite to 12 hours. So that is quite an improvement for us. Uh, and if we had stopped here for the year, I would have been happy and proud this meant we could really start doing things. Um, we could really start fixing these mapping issues. And, and I'm going to show you some of the mapping issues that we did have uh, and now that we could start fixing them. So one particular uh, complaint we were getting was uh, queries for this name, Danny O'Connor. Uh, I believe he's a congressman uh, or a congressional candidate. Um, but we weren't getting any good results for this. Uh, and we were actually getting a lot of results for uh, Danny O'Leary and Danny O'Brien as well. And that's sort of a curious thing to have happen. Uh, so when we were looking at what was happening in the analyzer, it turns out they were all becoming this. Cool. Uh, so this is an easy, this is an easy fix, right? but we just couldn't do these before. Uh, and this is something that now we fixed, and it works, and you can do this query and actually get relevant results. Uh, another query that was failing uh, for people, uh, an example one like this, Brett Stevens, First Amendment. So Brett Stevens, uh, op-ed columnist, First Amendment, a topic. Uh, you might expect to get a piece of content like this. So, Here's an article by Brett Stevens talking about the First Amendment. That makes sense. Uh, in fact, we were getting this result on the left as the top result. And that's because of that query we had, uh, and this being a newer asset, uh, it was matching most of those terms. So the way you and I read First Amendment is obviously as a single concept. It's an idea for us. But Elasticsearch doesn't see it this way. It's just tokens. So it, we were getting Brett Stevens' amendment plus that uh, that date boost, uh, this piece of content was winning. So really, another simple fix here. First Amendment uh, in our corpus is a concept. It's something used a lot, uh, or that is written about a lot. So we just did this for everything. Um, all of a sudden, these queries work now. <coughs> but there was still an issue with our system. Uh, we could fix these mapping issues and iterate on them. But we were unable to make query changes still. So it was still a real, a real like, tricky thing. If we were to update a query, we might break something. Uh, and this is when we realized we needed to start pursuing uh, offline metrics. 
Uh, and in this case, it was the uh, creating a judgment list so we could have a ground truth. Uh, and this is because there's a, a tension uh, between optimizing queries for certain use cases. Uh, so a common kind of search for us is people are looking for a particular article, like they've read it in the newspaper or they remember some of the keywords and they want to find it again to share it with someone. Um, the problem is we can't make that match too well because we have content like this from the archive where you have headlines like financial, New York politics, or Cuba. And it's really unlikely that if someone is searching for Cuba today, that they want this piece of content from 1851. And so the way these metrics work is we gather a query, and then we issue a search against our system, and then we grade it. So we grade on a one to five scale. Uh, in this example, you can see these first two articles are recent articles about the Apple iPhone. This third article is about the Apple iPhone, but it's from right before it came out. So it doesn't get such a high score for us. It's, not pr it's probably not what something, someone is looking for unless they were to also add a date filter. This last article is a recipe for apple pie, 100% irrelevant. This is not something we'd ever want to surface. <clears throat> And so we just had to gather a lot of queries and do lots of judgments so we would have an understanding of how our system worked. And this is extremely tedious. This is not fun work at all. Uh, but it's extremely important to do. Uh, in fact, I would say it's crucial. It lets you know sort of what effect the change you're going to have uh, or, or any query changes you're going to make will have uh, overall. <clears throat> so with this in place, we could actually start to change our queries. Uh, and this was a nice position for us to be in. Uh, we hadn't had confidence in making query, or query changes like this before. Uh, an example of a kind of query we can now fix is a query like Hard Day's Night. So this is an album and a movie from the Beatles that came out in 1964. In this particular case, the user was looking for the original review of the movie. Um, the problem is our writers also use this as a pun a lot. So you have content like this that it isn't about the Beatles at all, or content like this that also isn't about the Beatles. Um, and so this is tricky. It's a hard thing to balance, and you know, with search, everything is a compromise. And with our offline metrics, we could actually begin to have that conversation. Before, it was just spot checking and seeing how things worked, but now, we could say, uh, we, we could actually have, an, uh, have a conversation around the actual metrics coming out and see, like, we can improve this search, but it hurts these other searches. And is that something that's okay with us? And if it is, we can make that change. Um, and these are the kind of things we could start fixing now. And so you get metrics like this over time. Um, these are two particular metrics. Each of these gray lines is one of our queries. Uh, and then the, the red line is this moving average over time. But so you can see, as we've iterated on our search over time, we've been able to improve a lot of queries and draw the average up. And so this was really cool. Uh, we had never been so confident before. We took this to production or we were getting ready to take this production. Uh, we deployed it one day, uh, and then we had a P1 outage. Search was down. Uh, down all, all downstream consumers were failing. Uh, this was a bad situation. Uh, so this sucked. Um, basically, before, uh, if you remember before, I talked about how we have all this old content. Uh, in fact, the bulk of it is really old. It's pre-digital. Um, it looks like this. So here is some old article, uh, and this is the OCR text. It's really high quality, as you can see. Um, the thing is, each of these words is a token in the index, 
uh, and each token has a performance impact. <laughs> uh, and we had 22 million tokens in our index. Uh, and this is bad, let me tell you. Um, so yeah, this is a, we had to remove this. Um, for, for scale, I wanted to uh, look up how many words are in English. So I found the largest dictionary that exists. It's this 20 volume edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, and it has 200,000 words. So we had 100 times more unique words than this 20 volume dictionary, uh, and that's a problem. So we removed this content, uh, and this really, really improved the performance of search, but now we could actually start doing more complex searches to really surface content. Um, with this change we deployed, things were looking pretty good. Uh, the final piece we were really missing in understanding our search system was online metrics, and that was the next big thing we tackled. Um, so we needed a way to understand what users were actually doing. So we obviously had ideas about search and about what kind of searches looked good. That doesn't mean that users feel the same way. Um, so we actually started collecting these metrics to see what kind of queries did well, uh, what kind of queries did not do well. Um, and with this, we were able to start making changes. <coughs> so an example of the kind of thing we could fix was uh, column searches. So this is a pretty common one we get where people search for a New York Times column in particular. So they'll search for modern love. Uh, in this example, it's news quiz, which is another pretty popular column. Uh, but people weren't engaging with it very much. Um, and it turns out the issue is that when people are searching for columns, they really want the newest stuff. They essentially want the reverse chronological sort of that column. Um, so we put a very strong boost uh, or like uh, emphasis on newness for column type things. And this includes searches for uh, author names directly, uh, directly uh, or sections, things like that. Um, but overall, we were able to improve the click-through rate quite a bit uh, just by doing that. And the idea of doing this has sort of expanded. Um, we now have like a monthly search trends report that we send out internally. Uh, it's to kind of see what topics are popular in a given month. I think this is February, so you might be able to spot um, events happening. Uh, so yeah, if you see Venezuela, that had a lot of news coverage in, uh, in February. Uh, but this lets us drill down into what areas we're not doing so well in and also celebrate the areas where we are doing well because uh, you don't want to just focus on the bad when you're sending out emails. Um, and yeah, this gives us kind of direction where to improve and it also helps us change uh, or, or refine our idea of what's relevant. So if you recall back to that, mm, those offline metrics, you saw a sharp dip at one point. Uh, that was actually due to the fact that our idea of what was relevant for certain queries was wrong. We had had an initial idea, but seeing that people didn't think the same thing uh, it, through their behavior, we sort of refined our ideas on this. <clears throat> and this brings us up more or less to where we are now. So I'm going to show you some of the stuff we're just now doing. Uh, and this is integrating with the New York Times Index. Well, that zoomed in. Uh, so it's a little hard to tell, but those things behind are actually books. Uh, the New York Times Index is essentially tagging that goes back to 1851. So there are tags on every article ever published. And for the longest time, they were published as a book. I think it stopped in 2017. Um, but you could buy this book and look up a person, you know, say you want to find articles about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you would find her in the index, 
see which editions, pages, sections she's mentioned in, and then you could go find that article. Uh, so this is just, it's tagging essentially, uh, to go but all the way back to the beginning. And this is an incredible resource. Um, we have a full-time taxonomy team who creates this data, uh, and this, they've been doing this since the early 1900s. Um, that data looks like this. This is the digital version, uh, and this is like a small version of it. But you have these different kinds of tags. So we have subjects. Um, we have organizations and persons. Uh, and you can see that there's a uh, display name, which is not really the display name, but it's the formal name. Uh, and then there's a more search-friendly name, which is the vernacular. Um, and a big challenge for us right now is most content doesn't have a vernacular, so we're working on adding that, but there's a lot of these times tags, uh, like a lot of it. Um, so these are all you know, unique tags for all the different assets we have. Uh, and there's other kinds too, so I'm showing you persons, locations, subjects, and creative works, uh, but there's some other kinds of tags. There's also relationships between these tags uh, so it's not just a ta it's not just tagging, but it's also a full taxonomy. Um, so, for example, you know, earthquake is a subset of natural disaster, which is a subset of you know an emergency event or something, and that's a made up taxonomy, but it's that kind of information. Um, so we're looking at how we can utilize this for search now. We've done the first pass with it. Uh, and it improved our click-through rate 5% just by matching on what vernacular existed and what display name existed. So I'm really excited about this. Um, and I think we're really fortunate as a company to have this resource uh, and this whole set of full-time taxonomists who are creating this incredible high-quality data. Uh, it lets us bypass some of the harder things a lot of people have to do, like entity extraction, because we have humans doing it. Um, and just for closure, we did solve this problem. So by adopting these techniques uh, and iterating on our queries uh, and iterating on our mappings, we were able to surface the right content for this query. <coughs> so I just want to leave you with a summary of some of the key takeaways that we learned through the last year. Um, <coughs> You need to understand search. This is the fundamental step to tackling this problem. Uh, you can't fake it. You have to actually really understand what's happening if you're going to fix this stuff. Uh, you need to make it possible to iterate. So this was a problem we had, right? We couldn't re-ingest our content. Um, but this is the biggest thing, or this is one of the biggest things. You can't fix search all in one go. You need to take it one step at a time, find some small class of queries that you can work on and fix, uh, and ideally not break other queries. And then you just have to repeat that over and over and over uh, until you can make search much better. You need to know where you're going. So this is where the offline metrics come in handy. Uh, you need to know that if you're making any query changes, you're not going to damage other queries too much. Um, there is obviously always that tension between optimizing for certain use cases, uh, but you need to understand the trade-offs you're making. Uh, you have to learn about your users. Uh, so this is online metrics, uh, like click-through rate, uh, sessions, abandonment, etc. cetera. Um, you have an idea of how search should work, but your users may have a different one. There are probably biases that you have uh, and mental models you have of how search should work, uh, and you're probably wrong on some of those. So it's worth seeing how users feel about it uh, and, and refining how you, how you understand search. Uh, and finally, you need to leverage your company. Uh, we have perhaps the most extreme case uh, with having this full-time taxonomy team to create very rich, very high-quality data. But Everyone has resources like this at your company. Uh, in the Ibotta talk yesterday, we heard about another team happened to have a taxonomy that they were able to use. You need to find the people at your company 
that are, you, are making things that you can use to make search better. It probably exists. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeremiah. So that was fascinating. Um, a thousand apologies about the, uh, the, the, basically the flickering of the image. That was tough on you, uh, Jeremiah. It, it, to... it wasn't my animation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we are trying to fix the problem. Um, all right, any questions? I'm sure there are a lot. Thank you. Uh, finally, I feel like a most relevant uh, like session for the relevant phase tech. And Thank one you. Uh, quick question. Actually. How did you solve that uh, Big Apple New York City synonym problem on your side? Which one? If you get a query like Big Apple City, right? So like synonym expansion problem, actually, did you get some that kind of issues? So the, the question is, how do we solve uh, like synonyms, people yes. using synonyms? Yeah, if you get a query like <laughs> Big Apple City, like it should be New York City, right? That's what they're looking for. Yeah, so that's also that's an issue we're still working on, and I don't actually know the best way. Um, the way we've been doing it is reading content to see what pops up and which searches fail, but obviously that's not super scalable. Uh, there's internally, there's a style book, uh, which is how writer, a style book for writing. Uh, so this is how journalists are meant to be writing about things. And there's certain phrases and ways they refer to things. So we've gone through that and added synonyms for things in there. Um, I don't have a good example. I mean, the First Amendment one is is probably an, uh, an example. I'll recycle for that. But they will typically write out first and second uh, up to 11, I think, um, as English text, but users almost never search that way. They put, you know, one ST or one amendment or something. So those are the sort of the synonyms we've been adding. But yeah, our, our big challenge is sort of systematically doing this because the domain for journalism is obviously everything else, right? It's very large. It references a lot of things. So it's hard to systematically attack something um, like you might do in like medical search. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Jeremiah. Thank you. Can you share some details about how complex your queries get? Do you mean the user queries or the queries that we make? Uh, user queries. Like, are there too many like logical operators, phrases, how lengthy they could be, and what do you have restrictions on what you support there? And so mm -hmm. Sure, so uh, for the site search, um, we don't expose a lot of features. You can do phrase searches, uh, and that's an implicit mu like must condition. Um, other than that, we don't allow any and or or operators. Um, yeah, I guess that's the whole thing. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I enjoyed your talk. Um, the you, you have some uh, searches where you you infer that date is very important, like columns. You said. Do do you have other searches where you're, you're able to infer the reverse, like recipes? You know, for example, that where date it, you would infer that date is not important. Yeah. So recipes are definitely one where the date isn't so important, um, except. So that's also kind of tricky if you're thinking like Thanksgiving recipes. Those tend to get written and rewritten over again. Uh, and so we would probably want to resurface or surface the newer edition of the same like stuffing recipe again. Um, but yeah, so news is a tricky domain because most keywords aren't super newsy until they are. Um, so the you know if I'm gonna use an example of say like Notre Dame, if you had searched that a month ago, what would someone be looking right? Possibly travel stuff uh, or other cultural pieces, but now it's like a the meaning has changed completely. 
Um, and yeah, that that's, I don't know, that's like a tricky open question in news search, I think. I just have one other question. You, you mentioned that uh, there was, you kind of stumbled on this moment was when you were trying to improve your query where you realized that you didn't have the content mm -hmm. available. Was, was that a shocking moment within the New York Times that you didn't have access to a New York Times <laughs> content? Um, it was one of those like low key anxiety things that you have all the time in your infrastructure. I'm sure everybody has this in the company. You're like, oh, I hope that never goes down. Um, Cause yeah, we had this data that had been analyzed and processed um, sitting in a Mongo database somewhere. So the way the architecture was before was that we had the analyzed text in Elasticsearch uh, and then some subset of it in Mongo to surface the data you needed to make the response. Um, Cause I think the, like the old version of Elasticsearch wasn't as performant for storing all that data. But yeah, that was, a stressful time. <laughs> I guess that's the short answer to that. So on that note, Jeremiah, are you still, um, so are you storing everything you need in Elasticsearch in, in the last uh, iteration of the architecture? Or yeah. Or are you still pulling stuff out of? Multiple? No, um, yeah, ev we have all the data um, in Elasticsearch now. It, it works fine. And I, I think also by not having the OCR content, it also helped it be performant enough mm -hmm. for that as well. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I wanted to ask you, because there are, you talk about the transformation from the old to the new method and approach, and there's this, was it a shocking moment with the data in the previous question and such things. And then you also talked about reporting that you were able to do in new ways for the company. Mm -hmm. As these transformations and approaches were occurring, what kinds of conversations were coming up with the business and with stakeholders. Were those evolving? Was, was, were you having different kinds of conversations leading into all this ever using? Yeah, so um, this was like a long running issue. Uh, and, and the impetus for making this single source of truth uh, wasn't just driven by search. A lot of other teams had issue with this um, because while Scoop is the main CMS that we have, uh, there are certain there are other ones for different kinds of content, um, and it's really tricky for consumers to know where to go. And actually, that logic had to live in every consumer before you would have to say like, "Oh, this is an interactive," uh, which is those like articles you see that have lots of graphs and movings, and you know you can. I guess, interact with. Um, those lived somewhere else. And so as a consumer, we would have to go to all these different uh, CMSs. Uh, there was also the blogs, which were WordPress. Um, that was an idea from like the mid 2010s, I think, or early 2010s. Um, and so it was just really challenging. And it also meant you couldn't kill any of these systems. So like the blogs idea, I think, has kind of ended, and those have just become columns again, or, or re-become columns. Um, but the thing is, you couldn't kill those systems. So like, if we needed to replay and re-ingest data, that system had to be up for us. Uh, and so the, the big architectural change we made is we have an immutable log um, of everything ever published in order. So. This is built on Kafka, and it's a slightly different use case for Kafka since it no nothing ever expires, nothing ever compacts. Um, but yeah, it, it lets us consume all the content in one source, and all publishers now publish to that. Uh, and then so all the downstream systems have one place to consume in one known uh, Protobuf format. I was curious if you had, um, it sounded like you did some hand grading of judgments. Um, if you had any, d how those judgments will change over time and if there's a temporal quality or if you're gonna retire them at some point or 
keep generating them or how you're thinking about that that process? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so in our judgment list, I, I showed you Apple iPhone, but there's always a date. So because we do new search, um, the way our judgment list work is it's a query and a date as a, the minimum set of parameters. Um, so I, and we also use our entire corpora when we're doing this. We don't make a subset. Uh, I know that's different from what I've read and heard a lot of people do, but it seems to work well for us. It just means that sometimes one small query change means you'll have to grade um, thousands of new assets. Uh, so that's the only downside. But at least you generate lots of negative <laughs> examples. Um, as far as retiring them, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure sort of the best way to do this long term. Um, I was, yeah, we may just keep adding to it. But we also, you know, I heard a lot of interesting ideas yesterday about having multiple judgment lists and sort of that inter ranker reliability. We have just one right now. Um, so we're not super sophisticated in what we're doing with that. So there's, yeah, there's a lot to explore there. Okay, last questions. We need to wrap it up. I, it seemed to me that in your use case, you might get a lot, you just are dealing with a lot of content that comes out at once. And if somebody's searching for, in one of your examples, Notre Dame, there might be a lot of, let's say, extremely factual reporting on the events of Notre Dame that happen one day after another after another. Um, so when you're looking at search results, it seems like bringing a diversity of articles would be super important, which is something that my company would also face. We generate a lot of similar content. And so we think, okay, these three are the most similar documents to that query, but they're also very similar to themselves. So if they're not looking for the first one, they're also probably not looking for the second or the third one. Um, have, have you done anything with the way that your query systems operate to kind of um, improve diversity in your search order or your rank order? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, a little bit. I've tried some small experiments um, with sort of shaping the kind of results we would have where, yeah, we would have this news content, but we'd also bubble up some like travel piece and a politics piece if relevant. Um, and uh, yeah, I did an experiment with like, we have a pretty common query of just India. Like people search that a lot. Um, and a lot of that will be just like politics and news. But I know another, you know, when people are looking for India, they want travel uh, or they want food. There's a lot of content we publish that's, to me, seemed relevant. Um, so I tried to do like a mini experiment to surface this other kind of content to increase the diversity there. That didn't pan out very well. Um, but yeah, it's something I'd be interested to explore because I obviously just tried for one query and not in a particularly systematic way. But yeah, that's a really good idea. Thank you, Jeremy. Round of applause, please. Great talk. Learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>